Welcome to another episode of Thinking Like a Bank, where we show you how to think like a bank by applying the same strategies and principles that banks use to help you find more financial freedom in your life. I'm your host, Sarah Ibrahim. Today, I'm interviewing Aubrey Janik. Aubrey is a content creator and car sharing expert with over 300,000 subscribers on social media and a 25 car sharing fleet. Through social media and her course, the Car Sharing Masterclass, Aubrey has taught thousands of students how to increase their income by scaling a car sharing fleet. Hey, Aubrey, welcome to our podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to talk about Turo and how it works. But before that, can you tell us a little bit more about your background and how you found out about Turo? Yeah, absolutely. So um, as far as my personal background goes, I have a background in franchising as well as in now, of course, in content creation in the automotive industry. But um, I've always been really interested in cars. Like even whenever I was younger, I really liked cars. My my whenever we started Turo, my then boyfriend, now husband, was a big car guy. And so cars were kind of a big focus of our life. And at the time that I, I found out about Turo, I was actually I had owned a franchise and um, a, a person that I, I worked with for marketing, a, a friend of mine, he had told me like, hey, I just bought this Mercedes. Um, I I can't recall what type of Mercedes it was, but it was a pretty nice one. And it's like, hey, I just bought this Mercedes. I like would have never purchased this, but I'm going to rent it out on Turo. And so like we were just kind of having a like friendly conversation about his new Mercedes. And he told me that that's why he bought it. And at the time, I had never heard of Turo, or I, I had heard of Turo. I saw it like on Facebook ads, but I never really dug into it because I thought it was a scam. <laughs> and so after my friend had told me about this, like that night, I went on Turo, I looked at the website. And at the time, I had a 2000, it was like a 2010 or 2011 Jeep Wrangler. I can't recall the exact year. But at the time, I had a two-door Jeep Wrangler that was like my daily driver. And I really didn't like this car. Um, I had previously driven a 1997 Toyota 4Runner. So I went from my 4Runner to this Jeep Wrangler and I didn't like it. And so like that night I went on the Turo and I was like, you know what, this could be perfect for my Jeep. I listed my Jeep Wrangler that day um, or that night. And then it was rented out within about 24 hours and then kind of never turned back from there. Oh, well, okay. And and how many cars, I, I watched your videos on YouTube and it looks like you have a pretty like good amount of cars on tour mm -hmm. if you don't mind if you mind me asking like how many do you have now listed yeah absolutely so we have 27 in our, oh, wow. our car sharing fleet oh wow okay and is it like a simple process like you just post your car and then post a description and how much you want and then people find it and then reach out if they're interested yeah, so it, it works really similar. Like I always compare Turo and just car sharing in general to like an Airbnb for cars. So like the booking process is, I think, very, very similar to how it is with Airbnb. And so um, both and I, I've never listed a property on Airbnb, so I can't make that uh -huh. comparison. But the, the listing process is really simple. And so you have to make sure that you get a car that is eligible for Turo. So like I always tell people, review the Turo terms of service, make sure that that car is is eligible and then from there, uh, you just go through, you list the car, you have to provide basic information like the trim, make, model, VIN, license plate, things like that. And then, yeah, there's the the aspects of like choosing the features, choosing your settings, like what's your price point? When do you want this car to be available? What does your advance like notice look like? So like how much lead time do you need between the guest booking and the guest picking up the car? What type of bookings do you want? Do you want to do deliveries, advance notice, um, instant booking, which is basically when anyone can book your car? And then from there, you, you write the description. So of course, want to make sure that your description's good, take good photos, and then pretty much it's like good to go. I think that if you were listing your car for the first time on Turo, it, it might take you a couple hours to go through. But like mm -hmm. once you, you get the hang of it and you've done it a few times, it maybe takes 30 minutes to list a car. And then from the guest perspective, whenever they book your car, they just go through, they figure out like what city they're wanting to book in, the dates, the time of the pickup. And then you you go through and you get a list of vehicles that match that criteria. And then you can also filter by price, type of car. So do you need a, a seven-seater? Do you want a two-seater? What does that look like? And then from there, you can choose the car that you want. And you go in, you book it. And then it's very, very similar to like a typical rental car booking, Airbnb, hotel, anything mm -hmm. like that. And then like Airbnb, it, there's there are reviews, right, for the host? Yeah, and and there are reviews for Turo Host as well. Okay, um, so what if you're new and you don't have any reviews? Is that going to impact like getting your first car rented? Um, I mean, I, I think yes and no. So I, I think absolutely it can. 
Um, so a few things about the review system is, is one, Turo, and I don't know if this is true or not, but it's something that I've heard and even just talking with other Turo hosts, I think it is true, is that whenever you list your first car on Turo, there is like a bit of a boost in the Turo algorithm because Turo wants your first car to get rented because they want you to be successful and be like, oh, I got this first rental. I'm now going to like continue to rent this car and then I'll get a second car. And so I do think that there is a bit of a boost on that end. Um, but what I always tell people, you know, is whenever you're first getting started on Turo, whether it's a car that you're listing for the first time or if it's your very first car that's being listed, um, making sure that your cars are priced really competitively, if not like the cheapest in your market, is going to be one of the best ways to really get that ball rolling because reviews do matter and, and we get – we get so many people who book with our cars and say, hey, we chose you because of your great reviews. And so if you are a host that has no trip history, you don't have reviews, there is a bit of a more uphill battle, but I think it's really easily overcome by one, being transparent about the fact that this is your first, like you've just started, but you're still going to be taking it seriously, being professional. So making sure that you have your photo there, you have your profile filled out. And then of course, offering really competitive pricing on those first few rentals. And then from there, you can kind of rack it up. Okay. And I know it depends on the car and the type and a, a, a lot of other factors, but like, could you give me like a range of like when, what could expect, like, as far as like revenue, another way to like ask that question is like, imagine if you had like a $10,000 car, how much could one expect like on a daily basis from a car, like around that range? Yeah, absolutely. So it really varies. And so I, I, I will say that you know, your different types of cars are going to generate different revenue. And whenever you talk about revenue on Turo, there are a handful of factors that come into play. Number one is your daily trip price. If you have any like claims. So for example, with Turo, if a guest doesn't fill up the gas tank, you get a $10 convenience fee, which sounds like nothing. But like if you have five or six guests that do that in a month, that's 50, 60 bucks. Yeah. Um, you have things like overage miles. You also have... Um, uh, the daily trip rate, which I just mentioned. Yeah. And then you also have your, your, what's called your utilization rate, which is what percentage of days is this car being booked out? And so if you have, you know, utilization rate of 5%, you're going to be earning significantly less than somebody who does 90%. And most hosts aren't going to have 5% unless their cars are just blatantly blocked off. Mm -hmm. But for a $10,000 car, I mean, I think you can easily expect to earn anywhere between 800 and $1,300, depending on the market. And what I found with my own fleet is there isn't a huge difference in earnings between a $5,000 car and a $10,000 wow. car. Okay. You're really going to be kind of like, really up until you get to certain more specialized markets, your earnings potential is going to be relatively the same until you get to those newer cars, larger cars, specialty vehicles, cars, um, like luxury cars would be another example. So kind of these more like, average everyday car, your earnings potential is going to be pretty much very, very similar, maybe uh, maybe five to 10% uh, higher with a, you know, $10,000 car, $12,000 car versus one that's maybe five to $7,000. That makes sense. And then what about like the maintenance? Like, are you having to look, for example, a $10,000 car that's being rented out like 20 days out of 30 days a month? Like, what could one expect as far as like maintenance, like keeping up the car, like I guess because because the maintenance increases right when people are driving the cars like for sure. consistently. Yeah, so your maintenance and repairs are definitely going to accelerate whenever people are renting them. One is because you're just going to get more mileage. Your cars mm -hmm. get much more use than if you were using them yourself. But then also because your cars are just going to get abused. I mean, that's the reality of <laughs> renting cars: is people never treat anything uh, like if something that doesn't belong to them, you're not going to treat as well if, if they owned it. And so maintenance and repairs are definitely a, a huge piece of the puzzle. And it, it depends on what type of car you have. And so like a good rule of thumb is that whatever maintenance you're going to do, it's going to accelerate. I also am a big believer of preventative maintenance. And so we are quite sticklers for, you know, making sure that oil is getting changed every 5,000 miles, making sure that the tires are being rotated, making sure the cars are getting in inspected. And that helps kind of, uh, preemptively prevent a lot of the major issues that may come up because we can oftentimes catch things before they happen. But it also comes into play with the types of car that you choose. For example, if you have something like we have a 2007 Yaris in our fleet that's been uh -huh. listed for years. We've had it since either 2018 or 2019. We've had it for an extremely long time. And this 2007 Yaris has been just bulletproof. It has had very few issues. It's extremely reliable, extremely cheap. 
Whereas on the flip side, we have a 2015 Kia Rio, which was like a complete mistake to purchase. And that car has been just riddled with issues. And oh, so right. the maintenance is going to drastically depend on what type of car you choose, the maintenance history of that car, the rep, like how reputable the, the reliability is of that car and kind of those factors as well come into play. Yeah, that makes sense. I think like, um, yeah, absolutely. It, you know, Kias and Hyundai's versus, I mean, I know Kias and Hyundai's have probably like up their game in the last like 10 years compared to their previous, but yeah, I, I could definitely see that from that side, like the type of cars. Uh, and since the podcast is called like thinking like a bank, I'm, I'm curious, would it make sense to finance cars or lease cars and then put them on Turo or cash only, or what's kind of like your perspective on buying the cars? So I do not like leasing cars. I think that of all of the strategies that you can use to grow Turo, leasing is the my least favorite by far. Um, just because I think the mindset with leasing is, I, I'm not a fan of leasing in mm -hmm. any context. I don't think it's a good idea. I think it's a waste of money. And so that's part of the reason. But then it's kind of like this idea of like, hey, you're renting a car to rent a car. And part of the benefit of Turo and part of where you can really end up making a lot of money is buying cars that are below market value. You get a steal on, of a deal on these cars, you run them on Turo for a few years, and then you sell them for the same amount that you you paid for them or slightly less or sometimes even more. Yeah. And so being able to have equity in the cars that you purchase is important. I mean, today I could liquidate my entire fleet and have close to 200 grand that I could spend on other things. And so being able to build that equity, I think is crucial. And you can't do that with leasing, obviously. Mm -hmm. Financing, I think is a good route um, if you're very strategic about it. So there are hosts out there that, you know, will go out and they'll finance five or six cars at once, or they'll have an entire fleet of finance cars. And I think that's a very risky game that I, I never advise people to play. I do think that realistically speaking, cars are expensive. Not everyone has five, ten, twenty thousand dollars lying around in order to get started with Turo. And even technically for me, my first car was financed because it was my personal car that I put on Turo and I had financed it for personal use and then used it for Turo. And so I think that financing your first car or even your first one or two cars to get your foot into the door of Turo and then kind of financing one or two cars at a time moving forward to help grow your fleet, I think can be good if you can be strategic about it. But for me personally, I've grown my fleet for the majority with with all cash cars. So we we did have my Jeep, which was financed. We bought a Maserati a couple of years ago, which has since been totaled, which we financed. But other than that, um, all of our cars are just paid for in cash and we just own them outright. That makes sense. And and how passive do you think it is? Like, for example, like how much time do you spend per car per, I guess, week in just overall work that you have to do from the app, from dealing with people, from maintenance? Like how passive could this be for someone? So it depends on your car count, truthfully, is I always tell people, you know, from I think zero to 10 cars, it can be truly, I, I don't like the term passive in this context, because it does require work. But mm -hmm. I, I always refer to Turo as like a semi passive income stream. And I think that that's a pretty accurate term It's like with from zero to 10 cars, it can be very semi passive. And actually with um, I, I manage my fleet with my husband, and we have a part time employee. And so but we just hired the personal employee. My husband joined the team two years ago, full time. And but up until two years ago, I managed our fleet of at the time about fifteen cars. In addition to having a corporate job, in addition to doing YouTube, wow. so it was like one of of three pretty time consuming gigs. And I don't think I would have been able to do that had Turo not been as semi passive as it was. And so it depends on your car count. I also think it depends on how you run your business. For example, we do all of our key exchanges remote meaning we don't meet our guests in person. They do all of the, all of the instructions are sent via the app. There's a lockbox at our cars. They get the keys from the lockbox and then it's all done remotely. But if we met our guests in person, I mean, it would become a full-time job at like 10 cars, it may be 15 cars. Yeah, yeah. And so it depends on how you run your business, how many cars you have. I will say that zero to 10 is pretty semi-passive. 10 to 20, you start to feel the squeeze and, and it really takes like more time and where we're at now um it's i think i think it could definitely be like one person's full-time job is with 27 cars and so um we hired an employee because we have other projects as well that we're working on but i think that if Turo was our only focus it could be one person's full-time job but there is a point where it no longer becomes passive and it does become a full-fledged business yeah, definitely. I see that. Yeah. Um, how, so you have a course, right? I think, um, can you tell us a bit more about your course, how it works? Like when, what could someone expect from going through your course? 
Yeah, absolutely. So my course teaches, it's called the Car Sharing Masterclass, and it teaches people how to start and scale a car sharing fleet with the same business model that I use. And so my business model that I talk and kind of preach about is called, it's just like what I refer to as the low end economy cash car business model. So it's this idea of buying these normal everyday cars that people need in order to get to and from work to run errands. And that's how I base my business model off of. So we don't buy, you know, sexy cars. We don't have really any high value cars in our fleet. Our highest value one is a 2013 Lexus and uh, we purchased it for about 11 grand. But that's the highest in by far in our fleet. And so we really, we we buy Hyundais, we buy Ford Focuses, Toyotas, things like that. And it's teaching people how to grow their fleet with the same business model. So how to make it as passive as possible, how to buy the right cars, how to maintain your cars properly, how to implement the systems and the processes to set yourself up for success. And it really is kind of the blueprint of what we've been doing since 2017 whenever I started with Turo. Awesome. And how can the listeners connect with you and find that course? Yeah. So they can find it at uh, www.thecarsharingmasterclass.com. You can also find me on Instagram at aubrey.janik. I also post here on YouTube very frequently and my YouTube channel is just my name, Aubrey Janik. Awesome, Aubrey. It was a pleasure interviewing you and I'm looking forward to having you back on the podcast in the future. Thank you for having me. To learn more about what we do and how we can help you grow more wealth, please visit www.finassetprotection.com. That's F-I-N, assetprotection.com. The topics presented in this podcast are for general information only and not for the purposes of providing legal, accounting, or investment advice. On such matters, please consult a professional who knows your specific situation.